What is the most common intestinal parasite here in the United States? How do you get it? What are some of the symptoms? And how do you go about minimizing the risk as well as some of the treatment options available for it? So let's get right into this video. So the number one intestinal parasite in the United States is Giardia. It's a protozoan infection. There's approximately 1.1 to 1.2 million cases per year here in the United States. Transmission is fecal oral, basically contamination of water supply typically, and you're gonna get it or you drink it or surface contamination, or maybe somebody has it and goes to the bathroom and they don't wash their hands properly, okay? So fecal oral route, Basically, you're going to get the Giardia in the cyst form. Basically, it's you know, very protective, so it's kind of floating around and it lives there. <clears throat> so, water, food, daycare, infected even swimming pools, as well as sexual activity can also transmit Giardia. It can be contagious up to several months. Incubation period, so once you contract it, you may not have symptoms initially, but it might take one to seven days before you start to experience some sort of symptom. And symptoms can last anywhere from one to three weeks, okay? Initially, you can get a lot of diarrhea, gas, bloating, etc. Abdominal cramping is a big thing where you're having just, you know, bent over pain, nausea, fatigue, and dehydration, okay? There is a certain population, they might have some of this very temporarily, and then the symptoms go away and they become an asymptomatic carrier. So you gotta look out for that. You can develop food sensitivities post-infection. So I've had many cases where patients would have a GI infection. They went somewhere, they got food poisoning, they, drank, uh, they swam in a pool or a lake that was contaminated, and they get this infection, whether it's Giardia or other types of infection. Once they get that infection and get it cleared up, either with a antiparasitic medication or antibiotics, whatever the mechanism is, they can often develop some sort of food sensitivity thereafter. And I think this is really due to an immunological disruption due to the infection, but you can develop things like uh, gluten sensitivity, you can develop uh, dairy sensitivity as a result of a infection, right? Another interesting thing is that these infections can also um, trigger irritable bowel syndrome where you have just a lot of gas and bloating and discomfort, but not diagnosed with any disease. Or you can get IBD or inflammatory bowel disease. This can be Crohn's disease, it can be ulcerative colitis. I've had a few cases where people get infected and they develop an autoimmune disease related to that infection, or that infection is a trigger for the autoimmune condition. So you gotta look out for these types of things, okay? So, testing. You can do stool exams, and you can look at it under a microscope, etc. You wanna do that for multiple days if you don't catch it on the first round. You wanna do a second or third round, okay? Or you can do an antigen testing. You have an EIA or a PCR test. The PCR is very sensitive, uh, more accurate. Um, so you want to probably do an antigen test uh, to get the right answer if you have the symptomatology. I listed the medications here. I don't, I don't prescribe medications, but I'll list them here. This one right here is more kid friendly, so it comes in a liquid form. And you, some of them you have to take for multiple days. Some of them you can just take one dose. However, you want to make sure you get the infection, right? Because you don't want to be contagious. You don't want it to overgrow in your system again. Supplement-wise, so <clears throat> if you are in a life and death situation and you get Giardia and you have significant diarrhea and you have just, you just dehydrated and you don't know what to do, right? Obviously, you want to take the medication. But if you have time and effort, you can do supplementation. Sometimes it's nice to do the medication and then follow up with some sort of a nutritional protocol to make sure one, you got the infection and two, you heal the gut. So number one is berberine, right? 
In the literature, between 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams in divided doses. Um, and you want to probably do these types of protocols combined, not just one. So berberine, 1,500 to, uh, uh, 1, to 1,500 milligrams in divided doses throughout the day. You can do garlic extract, 600 to 1,200 milligrams in divided doses. You can do oregano oil or time-release oregano works really well here. 100 to 150 milligrams in divided doses. And you definitely want to supplement with Saccharomyces boulardii. Saccharomyces boulardii can knock down the infection. It can help re-inoculate the gut. And it's antibiotic resistant. So it's a good way to re-inoculate the gut. Up to 500 milligrams per day. You can probably even go 1,000 milligrams per day. Okay, And you probably want to do a gut re restoration program. What I mean by that is you want to do something to heal the gut after you're taking medication or after the infection. You don't want this infection to trigger food sensitivities as well as IBS or IBD. Okay, So it's important to do gut restoration. What I'll do is I'll list some of the products that I would use. Uh, and you can check out the link below on the full, full script uh, online store where you can purchase these supplements. So I'll go ahead and list the exact ones that I would use. Okay, so it's important. Make sure you do a gut restoration program after infection just to prevent IBD and IBS in the future. All right. My name is Dr. Jin Sung. We're clinical excellence meets excellent results. And we'll see you guys next week on the healthy side. Have an awesome day.